Joining us now is retired four-star U.S. Navy Admiral James Tavridis, who served as the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, and Dmitry Elkarovich, the Executive Chairman of Silverado Policy Accelerator, a D.C.-based geopolitical think tank focusing on national cyber and energy security issues. Admiral, first to you. What does Ukraine need to fight Russia in this going into this winter period? It's been stalemated. And now the speaker says today, nothing for Ukraine, nothing for Israel until they figure out the border security. And that's not going to happen this week before they're supposed to go home to Christmas. And then they don't come back till, you know, after January, uh, mid-January, first, second week, second week. Where does this leave Ukraine? Yeah, the Pentagon still has sufficient money, armaments, kind of in the pipeline that can probably stretch for a month or so. Um, Europe, similarly. Beyond that, it gets kind of dire for Ukraine, to be honest. And um, we ought to be deeply concerned about that. And for starters, it would enable Putin potentially to re-energize on the offensive side. They've been stalled offensively for over a year. But if Ukraine were really cut off from the armaments it needs, and presumably the money would therefore choke down the possibility of getting the F-16 fighters, getting the ATACMS long-range missiles, it, it, it would be a dire moment for Ukraine. That's why President Zelensky has come to Washington. Unfortunately, I don't feel optimistic about it happening before the break. We're on thin ice here, Andrea. And Dimitri, NBC News has been reporting now, our colleague Dan DeLuce reporting that the U.S. has declassified intelligence, showing some progress. And clearly the timing is the same at Congress. But they've told Congress that there have been 315,000 Russian troops killed or wounded out of the pre-invasion force of 360,000, that Russia's sustained huge losses in equipment, 2,200 tanks destroyed, a force of 3,500 originally, according to this assessment. Um, so we see that they've had to draw down on supplies. They're getting resupplied in other kinds of you know, armaments from North Korea. They're getting drones from Iran. So they've got a pipeline, money from China dual use from Chinese companies. But, you know, where do you see this? And if there is a stalemate, which many people believe, how do you break that gridlock? What policy, what new strategy could you come up with? Well, Andrew, I think the stalemate is the wrong way to look at it, because even though Russia has sustained these huge casualties, they keep on mobilizing, they keep on getting resupplies, they've ramped up their massively the defense industrial base. In fact, for their next year's budget, 40 percent of that budget is now going to be uh, military and defense related. So you see them with an edge. Yes, uh, he could be if we're not resupplied, as Admiral said. If we're not providing ammunition to Ukraine, if we're not providing air defense interceptors to hit at these drones and missiles that are flying into Ukrainian cities, this is a matter of Ukrainian survival and the survival of their people. It can get really, really dire. What, what do you think should be done to change the whole atmosphere? What should Ukraine, if they had the armaments, what should they do differently? to try to well, get out of this? I think at this point, they have to look at the reality that even if this aid passes, the ammunition production constraints that we currently have in the U.S. and in Europe are so t uh, rough right now, even though we're trying to ramp it up, that next year we're probably unlikely to supply them with enough ammunition to actually eclipse Russian advances and, and fires. They're probably going to get around 2 million shells from North Korea over the next couple of months. They've already received a million. They're, they're able to produce over 2 million themselves. That's a huge, huge advantage that the Ukrainians will not be able to compensate next year. So I think they need to start thinking about digging in, making sure that the Russians don't take more of their territory. And then preparing for an offensive maybe net late next year, early 2025. But this is going to be a long war. And I don't want to blow your head up here, Admiral, but Republican Senator J.D. Vance says that Ukraine is going to have to just cede some territory to the Russians to bring the war to a close. What's your reaction to that from the Ohio senator, well, Republican I, senator? Yeah, I, I think it's premature to presuppose how a negotiation would come out. And at the end of the day, I could conceive of a world that this war ends looking somewhat like the Korean War, uh, with lines roughly where they are now, uh, a, an armistice, although a state of war continues to exist. The quid pro quo, of course, for Ukraine in that scenario would be membership in 
uh, NATO membership in the European Union. But look, Dimitri's right. We're a long way from that point. Certainly, Putin will do everything to hang on, keep in the conflict through the U.S. election, hoping for a, a more welcome administration to his taste in the White House. Um, and the Ukrainians are going to fight as Vladimir Zelensky said earlier today, they're going to fight to the last person. So I think this will stretch on for a while. Our job is to continue to keep them supplied. And let me do some just quick questions to both both of you. First to you, Dimitri. Should Ukraine go after Russia, go after the heart of Russia? Do they have the... I believe they absolutely have to, because at the end of the day, the only way that this war ends is actually not on the battlefield in Ukraine, because you could see a situation where Ukraine takes back every inch of their territory, but all that does is move the front line. President Putin ultimately decides whether this war ends, whether he stops attacking Ukraine. And for that to happen, you have to break the will of the Russian elites to keep supporting this war. And that means attacks on um, military infrastructure in Russia. And very quickly, Admiral, uh, we now know from NBC News that a month after the San Francisco summit, President Xi has not delivered on his promise to restore military to military hotline communications. That is very disconcerting. And I worry a lot about Ukraine and Russia, but we ought to worry even more about a miscal miscalculation between China, say, in the South China Sea. That hotline is designed to prevent that. China needs to get that in place as they promised our president in San Francisco.